Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the 11 Bang Bang channel. I'm your host, Ethan Woods, and we're going to do some more work on another flintlock. Well, not really another flintlock, Old Shar. But before we do that, let's go ahead and give a shout out to our Patreons. And they are as follows. Josh B., By Land and Sea, Ian Harris, Diane Houston, John Jackson, Brian Proxmire, and Jacob Elbick, Edgeguard Pedersen. Thank you guys for helping us out with making these videos. Now, on to the show. So, we are working on Old Shar, and she's still a little dirty. We did some test firing with her, and she's working pretty good. Uh, if you couldn't tell, I didn't film it because... Whoop, there goes part. Uh, I didn't think it was going to be as big of a process as it was, but we've, we have fitted a new nose piece to this gun, and I will say that this nose piece here, it retains this rammer into the rammer channel quite well. Uh... But yeah, I didn't think I was going to have to remove as much material on the front end of this gun as I did. And I've actually removed a half a pound of wood from the front end of this gun. So it's starting to balance it out a little bit better, I've noticed. And we are going to order a middle barrel band from the rifle shop. And we are then going to shave the rest of this stock, kind of like we did up here, down to this rear barrel band and make the famous uh, swell at the rear barrel band. But that's not what we're working on today. Oh, and by the way, guys, if you're wondering about the Paget carbine, I've been working on it tonight for like the last five hours. Uh, there will be more stuff coming out on that gun. However, it's turning into more of a project than we planned on originally. So for now, I'm going to work on the Charleville a little bit. And the main thing we are worried about right now with old Char is we are trying to, and yes, like I said, it is dirty. Uh, we are fitting in a new spring from the rifle shop into this gun. Now, the one thing I did notice is that our first hurdle is going to be, I already had to drill out the hole for the screw because that hole was a little bit small. Uh, this spring is gonna work beautifully, except for one thing, and that is, if we line up our screw hole, our front pin hole is just about uh, a hole and a half off from where it should be. So this is actually a pretty easy fix because the spring is so wide it will cover up this old hole and we can simply just drill a new one right in front of it. And that will get us just about a perfect fit there. And if something were to happen and we got to go back to our old one we can slap it right back in there and it'll do the same thing. It'll still cover up the hole. So let's go ahead and let's get measured out and everything and get ready to do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to place the spring. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to screw in this spring. I'm going to screw this in here and you can see right there if it'll focus. And you can see we're kind of tilted so you'll have to kind of account for that. We'll move it back just a skosh. But right there is where we're needing to drill our hole. And I can mark this fairly easily by just taking and scraping at the lock plate right there. And you can see we left a little swipe mark. Now I just get a center punch and I line it up with the middle of the existing hole. And I center punch it and we drill it out. Alright guys, so as you can see we've got it in there. Uh, our hole's fairly well lined up. Uh, our only issue is, is the pin on the spring itself is a little bit big. Or I should say our hole is a little bit small. Uh... I could drill the hole out or I could just file the pin to fit and make a really nice fit on it. And that's probably what I'll do. So without further ado, let's do that. All right guys, so as you can see, I'm not clamping on to the spring itself. One thing I do know is this spring has not been treated yet. So, so it's, it's still kind of, it's not the right temper. So that's why I left the uh, gate on the, the casting so I can clamp onto that. I can really clamp hard. Let's see here. We're just going to kind of trim this down a little bit. We're just going to trim her a little bit more. All right, there you go. It's pretty well fit in there. Uh, got a little more finishing up to do on it. But man, that's going to look pretty sharp. Uh, so. What we're going to do next is we're going to get rid of this gate. Actually, we're going to finish fitting it up where it's perfectly fit. We're then going to get rid of this gate here. 
and then we are going to polish and heat treat the spring which I've done before in the past but I haven't really done on something like this. Anyhow we're gonna go ahead and take a break because it's already midnight and uh, I need to go to bed because I gotta go work in the morning. Anyhow we'll carry this on at a later date. All right, ladies and gentlemen, just got off work. It's another day. I'm a little bit dirty, but let's go ahead and get back to work on the feather spring for old Char. And while we're at it, I don't know where I put it, but we may be working on a mainspring too. But we've got it fit up in the gun very well. So now our next point of business is to get rid of the gate right there, which you're not going to get because it's not going to focus very well. But we're going to get that gate off. We're going to polish this thing to a mere finish and then we are going to quench it we're going to harden it and then we're going to anneal it a little bit and then maybe just maybe we'll be good to go Paper, and you can use emery cloth that'd probably be a really good idea for this we're going to start the polishing process I'm going to start it right here it is now ready to be uh, quenched as you can tell we've got her polished up pretty good here it's kind of hard to get there to the inside but I'm not too concerned about that I just wanted to make sure I got a very nice almost mirror polish on this thing and I'm going to add this. When you're, you're polishing this, I would strongly suggest you go with the length of the spring. Don't try to go across. If you go across, you're creating a small point in which you can actually snap the spring. It's a, called a, a tensioner, um, a tension point. So make sure you know, you're going lengthways with the spring, not crossways. Kind of like with the frizzin. So now we are going to have to heat this thing up and we're going to have to quench it and we're going to get this thing glass hard and ready to go into the annealing phase and then once it's annealed it can be worked gently into the gun. Okay for this phase I'm going to be drawing on several different sources because actually I had made springs before it's been a long time uh, it's kind of surprising now I think about it. it's been like almost 10-15 years ago but uh, I've done it before it's been a long time I think I can make it work. I'm going to be going off of uh, my book by Charles Chappell, the, uh, gun, my gunsmithing book from him. I'm going to see what he has to say. I'm also going to be using some information I've learned from Mark Novak's video on the subject. Very good informational video. I strongly suggest you go check it out if you haven't already seen it. And I'm also going to be going with the instructions from the rifle shop. Let me go ahead and read those to you right quick. It has been my experience that the secret to a good flint lock is in the polishing and in the hardening, especially on early locks that do not have internal bridles. This one does have a bridle, so we should be good there. You can double the speed of an early lock by hardening the cock, tumbler, and a lock plate. You can also speed up later locks by making sure that the lock plates are hardened, which we will be doing also with this gun. We use 4140 steel on all our lock parts except for the frizzins and the springs, which are actually made out of a CAS 6150. These are oil hardening steels, but we don't recommend oil hardening. But you will find that if you case harden the lock plate, internals, and frizzin, then use water quench, then use a water quench. It will give you a finer finish and a smoother bearing surface. You are not adding more carbon by doing this, but you are keeping the parts from losing any carbon while you are bringing the part up to the correct heat range, which is about 1650 to 1675 degrees, or a very bright reddish orange. You will find this especially true with frizzins where carbon content is very critical. A case hardened and water quenched 6150 
by a 1095 steel frizzen will spark 10 times better and hotter than any oil hardened one. Always be sure to draw the tail of the frizzen to a deep blue color up into the edge of the pan cover area. We've already done that. To harden a spring, we use a water quench. Use a propane torch or a rich flame on your oxycetylene torch. Uh, this is where I'm going to put in a little bit of a caveat. I have seen that if you use the oxycetylene, you get better results because the uh, oxygen, or not the oxygen, but the acetylene itself can actually add a little carbon to the steel. But I digress. Evidently, you can do it both ways. Bring the steel slowly up to a very bright red, almost orange, 1500 degrees, making sure that the spring is consistent in color all over. Then drop it into a container, room temperature water. Handle the spring carefully as it is now glass hard. Polish the spring for tempering the spring. Use an area where the light is not too bright so you can see the color changes easily. Start heating the spring from the largest end first, going over the entire spring, and the colors will start out a straw or a gold color going into a scarlet or a purplish color then into a shiny deep blue color continue heating slowly and this blue will disappear and start all over again with a clear shiny color then back into a gold color then into the scarlet or purplish color that's approximately about 700 degrees then into a dark blue black approximately 750 I'm not necessarily going to go too much into this part because this is where I'm going to go with what Mark Novak is and what Mr. Chappell, the author of my gunsmithing book, has stated, in which they say that you're actually better off um, tempering your springs in a pot of molten lead. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to be doing that. But without further ado, we're going to heat this thing up bright, 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 bright red. Uh, I'm actually going to be using map gas on this today because I don't have the oxycetylene torch with me. Uh, we're going to get it bright red. I mean, actually, when I say bright red, it's actually going to be orange. Uh, and we're going to quench it, and then we will go and we will temper it in some lead. Sorry about that, guys. Unfortunately, I went out there to go film the uh, hardening of my spring here. And uh, I found out that my card was full after I already had hardened it and polished it. But anyhow, so let me just run you through what I did. Basically what I did is I made myself a makeshift forge. I took a bunch of bricks and I laid two of them down low on the ground here. Well, not necessarily on the ground, but on a platform with a gap about that big in between them. Just big enough that you could actually fit the torch tip through with a rosebud on it and it would hold in place. Then I stacked some bricks along the side and then on top making my forge. Then I took my pliers and I grabbed a hold of the let me focus in on it here. I grabbed a hold of the feather spring here by the finial with a pair of old pliers and I ran it through with the thickest point of the spring, which would be the bottom of it right there, over the flame. And I did this for about two or three minutes until the entire thing was glowing a very bright orange throughout the piece. I had underneath of the forge a big old pot of water warm water actually pretty hot water and so as soon as I'd gotten it to where it was a nice uniform uh, bright orange I pulled it out and dropped it I mean it was immediately out of the flame and into the water so no chance for it to kind of start softening so right now this thing is as hard as glass as Mark Novak would say and you really don't want to risk dropping it on anything too hard because it'll probably just shatter so what we need to do to make it where it's not so hard is if you couldn't tell I've already polished this I've been polishing it with by hand for the last couple hours and I'm going to take this over to our lead pot and I'm going to drop this in there and let it sit until it turns a nice dark blue. Once it's turned blue, it should be the right uh, temper for a spring on a gun, but we will see. So without further ado, let me see if I can actually go and get that part recorded. Alrighty, it's kind of dark in here and that's kind of by design, but there's our part. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to drop it in this lead. The lead right now is actually about 630 degrees Fahrenheit. So we should get a nice royal blue on this part and actually the nice thing about this because lead is denser than steel 
the spring is actually floating up on the top of the lead so we can actually kind of see what's going on here and watch for the color change. Okay, so it's been about 15 minutes. I've already checked and it's a pretty nice nighter blue under all this slag, but there it is. Get all that knocked off as much as I can. But yeah, you can see we got a pretty nice, you know, you probably can't see too well because it's pretty dark, but we got a pretty nice nighter blue under all that junk. So we should be fairly well annealed. Now we just gotta let it cool naturally. I'm gonna actually sit it down on a, and I'll sit right over here or something. We're not gonna hit it up with anything too special, you know, not gonna dump it in any water. Just let it cool naturally for about the next 10, 15 minutes and then we'll go and we'll polish it all up. All right, so we've got this piece pretty much polished back up. We've got most of the lead off of it. And so now we are going to attempt to get it to spring. And this is a little bit of something you want to do before you put it back in the gun. Put it in a vise and slowly, very slowly, start working it. You don't want to compress it all the way right off the bat. But by the time this is all said and done, we should be able to compress almost all the way down. And you can see I'll go that far for about 20 times and then I'll add a little more. And right now I can tell that we've got a fairly nice spring here. And really, for being a feather spring, it doesn't have to go much more than that right there. So I'm not going to push my luck with it too much. And as you can see, we went right back to where we were supposed to go. Okay guys, so here we are. Uh, let's go ahead and check for that springiness. That's very smooth. As you can tell, we've already worked the spring on the vise, so it's a little heavy, kind of a, yeah, it's kind of a heavy spring. Let's see, where is our, I should probably put some oil on it, but that's, yeah, you can get to right there and then tickle it and it'll go all the way. Let's go ahead and let's put a little powder in here, see if we can get a spark. That ain't a whole lot of powder. Alright, let's see how she does. Worked. That's about all I got for you today, so as always, thank you for watching. Trust in God, and keep your powder dry. Bye.